Hallo und herzlich willkommen zur neuesten Ausgabe der Filmkritiken hier beim Telestammtisch. Und diesmal ist es ein Special, auf das ihr euch freuen könnt, denn euch erwartet keine klassische Filmkritik. Nein, ganz im Gegenteil, euch erwartet ein Interview, denn wir hatten die Ehre, Taika Waititi, den Regisseur, Schauspieler, Comedian, Drehbuchautor und vieles weitere, den man unter anderem ja auch vom dritten Torteil kennt, zu interviewen. Denn jetzt am 23. Januar 2020 kam endlich Jojo Rabbit ins Deutschland. Deutsche Kino und wir konnten ihn interviewen. Die Filmkritik zum Film habt ihr bereits vor einigen Tagen bei uns bekommen. Wir haben sich Stu und Schlogger zusammengesetzt und den Film ausgiebig besprochen. Vor allem war es ein schönes Gespräch, weil sie auch eine unterschiedliche Wahrnehmung von dem Film hatten. Und nun hatten wir eben das Glück, ein Interview zu führen mit eben Tiger White Titi und dem Produzenten des Films, Carthew Neal. Und die beiden saßen zusammen mit verschiedenen Journalisten am Roundtable. Das bedeutet also, dass auch wir die Gelegenheit hatten, unsere Redakteurin, die Leader hier zu diesem Roundtable zu schicken und das müsst ihr euch so vorstellen, dass da letztlich eine Handvoll Journalisten am Tisch sitzen, alle stellen eine Reihe um Fragen und im besten Fall ergibt sich dann auch ein Gespräch mit eben den Interviewgästen, die man dort hat und die hört ihr dann hier auch. Das heißt also, ihr habt hier nicht nur Lida die Fragen stellt, das komplette Interview ist übrigens auf Englisch, nein, ihr habt auch weitere Kollegen von verschiedenen anderen Quellen und die sitzen am Tisch, stellen Fragen, wir haben das Ganze aufgezeichnet und darauf könnt ihr euch jetzt freuen. Knapp 20 Minuten warten auf euch, eben Gespräch von Taika Waititi und Carthy O'Neill zum Film Jojo Rabbit und unter anderem auch den besonderen, sage ich mal, Fragen und ja einfach Gegebenheiten, die sich bei dieser Thematik ergeben und gerade eben auch, wie diese ganze Nazi-Satire letztlich auch in Deutschland funktionieren kann. Ihr könnt da sehr gespannt sein, es ist ein tolles Interview geworden, freut euch drauf. Ich persönlich freue mich drauf, dass ihr uns in irgendeiner Form bewertet. Das ist eben bei Podcasts ganz cool, wenn ihr auf Apple Podcast, auf Google, auf Facebook, auf Podcast.de und bei vielen weiteren Plattformen Podcasts bewertet. Wenn ihr das bei uns tut, dann hilft das den Telestammtisch sehr noch an dem einen oder anderen Ranking aufzutauchen. Ebenso würde ich mich freuen, wenn ihr uns Feedback hinterlasst. Auf Facebook, auf Twitter, auf Instagram oder auch beim YouTube-Upload könnt ihr das tun. Genauso gut könnt ihr auch auf tele-stammtisch.de gehen. Da gibt es unter anderem auch den Blog zum Podcast. Auch da gibt es eine Kommentarfunktion. Bitte sagt uns, wie euch diese Interviews gefallen, wie euch unsere Filmbesprechung gefallen und was ihr unbedingt noch von uns hören wollt. Das würde uns sehr freuen. Nun also viel Spaß bei diesem wirklich tollen Interview am Roundtable mit Taika Waititi und Carthy O'Neill, den beiden Köpfen hinter dem Film Jojo Rabbit. Bis dann, ciao. Well, how long did you live here? Uh, I lived here about two years, 97, 98, oh no, two and a half, 97, middle of 97. I lived just before 2000. Wow, so your German must be somehow existent. It's, much. it's a, no, it's, it's, it comes and goes, but only when I'm here. I don't speak it anywhere else, but I have to be here for a while, longer than one day, uh, for it to really... What were your there. impressions about the German people? Like... Back then? Yeah. Or Great. nowadays? Great. I mean, I loved it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have stayed. Mm. You know... It was like going to stay for the architecture or the cranes. Um, no, it was because I made a lot of good friends here and um, uh, and and had yeah I said uh, it was I very much enjoyed my time here and there was a lot of artists here at the time and I I felt very uh, I felt very at home. I and did it. It was also cheaper than New Zealand at the time, so it was, uh, it was that as well, which was great. And did it uh, influence your portraits of the Germans in your movie now, in a way? Not really. I think mainly like some of the, no, like I guess my accent came from like a mixture of people that I know and uh, sort of like some, some of the more quirky people that I'd met and just that, that style. But then, I mean, as you know, you know, just watching the film, there's like a, I mean, then, I don't know how many of those actors have even been to Germany, so I doubt that their portrayal is, <laughs> feels very German. But um, that was also a big point of this was that because it's written so heavily in English, you know, and and mainly for for English speaking people to perform, um, that you know I feel that that it's. Already very different, I guess, to you know, to the German sensibility, and it's a very contemporary approach to the dialogue um, because I, I wanted people to be able to relate to it now in twenty, well, in eighteen, nineteen, twenty, um, and I wanted young people to be able to relate to it as well. 
And again, that's why we used the music that we used in the film, just to make it feel like this story could be happening at any time. What, what, do you, I mean, what, were you a bit afraid of like coming here or, or of the reaction in Germany? This is a special reaction, this is a special perspective, obviously. I'm only concerned is if, if the jokes fall flat in the world, because some people I think will be reading it. And, uh, and I don't know if that gets the same timing as, uh, but most people, you know, that I feel the audience is aimed at, I mean, the film is aimed at uh, understand yeah. English enough to be able to get it in the moment. The big question, obviously, is like, uh, are you allowed to make fun of Hitler? Yes, that's, uh, Even I in mean, our, that's our, like, especially in our generation. You are, I would say, I but, you are. but still, yeah. uh, this is always like think, coming yeah. up in a debate or... I don't know. I think Cha I think Charlie Chaplin gave us permission in 1939. Um, then, but also, you know, I think that over the years, I think we're in good company because over the years people have been doing it with you know with, with mixed results. But um, yeah, I don't. I'm not worried about that at all. Um, and also, I don't. You know, it's look the film. Some there are some people who have criticised the film, but the, I think most of them uh, haven't seen it. So that's like some of the criticism has been from people who just refuse to see it, and which is fine. Some people just, you know, for certain reasons, maybe it's for personal reasons to with their families or whatever, just aren't ready to see a film like this. Um, on, uh, on one side, I feel like that's a little bit of a shame because they, um, because I feel like, you know, some degree they're missing out, but I also do understand that it might be too close to home and I have to respect that. Right. Um, you make fun of the Nazis, but you also make a lot of excuses for them. Um, do you think it's that easy to say, like, oh, they've been manip manipulated? Because if you grow up in Germany, you, you hear it a lot. Oh, everybody was just manipulated, but people really bought into that ideology because they loved it. And now they're buying into it again, and it's all coming back. So do you think that Nazis today really need more empathy? I don't think uh, the film at all is empathizing with Nazism or fascism or people who um, who truly believe in in, uh, in in those ideologies, but it does make some attempt to humanize some of the people who were normal people in the war. There aren't many of actual uh, people in the army in the film. Um, you know, it doesn't definitely doesn't empathize with any of the Gestapo. It makes them, you know, there's only even though the approach to that to their into their initial interact interrupt into introduction is very Monty Python in its in its nature. But even with Sam Rockwell's character, I like to think that you know, and I'm sure you're aware there were many people who were um, who were in the army who were career soldiers. Who did not identify or did not join the party, and who, uh, who, uh, who were just patriots, but you know discovered probably when it was too late that they shouldn't that they chose the wrong side. You know, so I feel like that's what Sam's character is like. I don't think anyone ever empathizes with Rebel Wilson's character, and um, I don't think anyone really cares about Alfie's character. Um, but yeah, no. So it's and I think. You know, it was a real effort on our part to make sure that it's from a child's point of view, and especially a 10 year old child who doesn't know any better. And I think it's very easy for someone to say, Yeah, but he was in the youth, he must have known. I mean, he was 10. So, you know, I think as it, when I was 10, I was probably quite easily influenced, you know, and who knows if I wanted to. And again, you got to remember, these kids, they wanted to be part of a group and. If all of their friends in the neighborhood were joining this thing as a 10-year-old, that is sure as hell what you're going to try and do. And, you know, I challenge any 10-year-old. I mean, you have to be very strong-minded as a 10-year-old to say, oh, no, I wouldn't have done that. Because you were bullied as well if you didn't join and you were picked on. And no 10-year-old 10 -year -old really wants to be that person. One of the interesting things, Roman, who plays Jojo, he was, he was 10 when he played the role. He's now 12. He showed the movie to his friends. Um, in England, he's from England, um, at school, and, and one of his friends came up to him afterwards and said, oh, I love the movie. I mean, it's all about, like, kids learning, you know, we have to think for ourselves. 
I think that's one of the most, that was like, a, when he told us that story, that was a really rewarding moment to, to hear that children could get that message from the movie. And that's, I think, one of the key things that we wanted, you know, wanted to get across was that actually you need to keep questioning your elders. You need to keep questioning um, the people that are, that are telling you things to make sure that they are actually telling you the right things because you can easily just be told the wrong things and, and go along with it. So that was a really rewarding moment for me to hear that. All right. Um, Mr. Waititi, in your TED Talk from 2010, you mentioned that when you were a child, you were obsessed by uh, of drawing the swastikas and the Hitler moustaches. Did you put this kind of experience into the portrayal of Jojo? No, I think I kind of forgot that I said that by that point. Um, I mean, it was never my intention to play that role, so it was never, when I was writing it, it was never really a thing that I was even thinking about. But going into that role, it was important that I didn't do a authentic portrayal of him because that's, that's not what the character is. And I think I would have needed a better actor to do that if I wanted a... Uh, a more realistic Hitler. Uh, no, um, no, no. I, I mean, into your writing of the character of Jojo, your experience as being obsessed by drawing oh, the swastikas. Mm, not really. I think just because it was something that was taboo growing up, you know, that you know, it was very uncool to draw swastikas. <laughs> but uh, it was just a thing, you know, when, when something's sort of forbidden or, or you, know, in, you know, you're encouraged not to do something, I think as a very young kid, it's the first thing you want to do. To uh, you know, in oh. private, and you sort of like, oh, I'm not seeing. Well, I guess it wasn't that bad. It's like, you know, it's, and that's, I guess, some like naive way of of, uh, of kind of giving yourself more power over that stuff. I think. And how did your family react when you showed yourself to them in the full Hitler costume? My mother was fine with it. She, um, I mean, she's proud of everything I do, and. But also, we come from a you know an intellectual family. We're very, you know, we're just not afraid of someone pretending to be or dressing up like that. You know, that does it. That for us is not scary. It's you know, and it's not insulting. It's a um, you know, there's a point to the film, and the point of the film is not to tell a joke. The point of the film is not to make a sketch or to make the film. A comedy. I think sometimes, you know, the film, you know, with other people trying to describe it, it can be misconstrued as a comedy about Nazis. And if you just simplify it to that, then it's doing the film a disservice. It's not a comedy. You know, it's a drama about children learning to think for themselves with some jokes in it. But there's some things like horrible things, obviously the Germans did, that you don't maybe explicitly touch on in the movie, like the Holocaust a little bit euthanasia, but watching it, I felt like you could have like gone there. You could have made it like even like way crazier, way tougher on the audience. Was it like where was the line where you thought I want to, I want to portray these things, but I will leave other things out? Well, I wanted a lot of it to be implied. You know, I'm relying a bit on people's previous knowledge, and I feel like the film would be another hour longer if I had to explain everything, which is what American films have to do. You have to explain every single thing to an audience. And I like to give the audience more credit for, you know, to be smart enough to work it out for themselves. And, um, you know, it's set right at the end of the war and it's not set in a camp and it's not set, it's not, I'm not going to suddenly put the character on a train to go and have a look and see what actually happened in those camps because that's not part of the story or part of his world. We can apply it by stories that people tell uh, and, You know, we can apply the mother's death by showing these shoes and then showing him seeing the shoes and looking up out of shot. But it's not our style to then have a shot of Scarlett Johansson hanging from a thing just because we want to shock people or we feel like, you know, that's going to make it more impactful. It's impactful enough to know that a young boy's mother is dead. And, you know, and that's what it's about. It's not... Uh, I'm, I don't do films that uh, that's just not my style to be to be that blatant or to have to to have to try and you know to try and make people feel uncomfortable. The film has got a deeper message than that, and 
I think if you want to see that stuff, there are many other films that have been made before this that deal with that, that are more graphic and I don't think it's shying away from anything. I don't think it's making light of the war or what happened. I think it's dealing with a very powerful subject um, in a way that has, I would say, um, a little bit more finesse than having to just suddenly, let's just show dead people everywhere. Um, you know, let's keep cutting away to see what actually happened. Um, you know, I think a lot of us do know that. How surprised were you, I mean, by the Oscars? Was that? Uh, by the Oscars, I mean, this was a lot. This is a lot. I mean, nominations and ch chances. Were you ever, like, considering that you were cons would be considered? I think that... I think that going into making this film with someone like Fox Searchlight, who have made a lot of films that have either won Oscars or been nominated for Oscars, I think that the conversation is always going to be there because it's, you know, it's a film made in, you know, or made by a Hollywood studio. So it's always going to get that attention by those people who vote. But shit, if you're going to make a film just to get Oscars, mm -hmm. then God help you. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not the reason that... We would, at all, we would just try and do something like this. Okay. Talking about... Um, in the beginning of the movie, there is this Hail Hitler pumping up scene between Hitler and Jojo. And I was wondering when Jojo mispronounced Hitler, saying, Hitler, you ask him, don't you speak proper German? Was that improvised? And if so, does this mirror your onset relationship with Roman? Um, yeah, definitely it mirrors it in the... Uh, and the friendship that we have and the way that we can hassle each other on set and make fun of each other. And, and so that would be often a way that we would interact. And that was an improvised line. In fact, most of that interaction was improvised. But, um, yeah. And that's, uh, well, we shot that of the two cameras, you know, facing each other so that we could interact and could talk to each other properly. Um, but yeah, that is exactly how Roman and I interact. Talking about the music, the, the songs, what, did you came up with them or the, the, the German version of Give Me Deine Hand? I mean, what did, did the Beatles say? What does everybody say about that? <laughs> well, I think as we all know, the, um, the Beatles were like the Hitlers of uh, the 1960s. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I think it's time to draw attention to, you know, to what they did. Um, but the the main thing was it was again to keep it contemporary, and then the original script was um, Heroes was always in there, Tom Waits was always in there, Arthur Lee and Love uh, was in there. The Beatles song came just during prep when um, I wasn't entirely sure what song would be used, but I did know that I was going to be using um, that old footage to show. The infatuation um, mm. uh, of the German people with Hitler, and and when I was looking through all the old footage of the crowds going crazy and women crying and screaming and people fainting, um, that was when I sort of really sort of realized. Oh, I guess he was like the Beatles of the '30s. He was a pop star and he was an icon, and and he really he had that effect and. That helps to explain to people the mindset of, of people, and especially young people, like little boys who looked up to him um, at the time. But you did not hear the song in a German pub when you were here for the first time? No, so I, already knew, like that. I always knew about the German versions of those songs. And there were other people like Roy Orbison's in there as well, singing um, uh, yeah, Mama. Oh, yeah, Mama. Um, mm. And then there's also, I mean, Johnny Cash also did his songs. I mean, as you all know, yeah, a lot of those artists did, did that. Um, in the end of the movie, when the David Bowie song plays, it's a pretty upbeat mood. The sun is shining and everything feels good. And um, the main character actually looks like he's going to be like an open-minded 60s kid. But in Germany, the next oppressive system, the GDR, was just around the corner. Mm -hmm. And even the, um, like... Um, The normal life wasn't that good so isn't that a bit misleading to pretend hey now happy times are coming because 
that just wasn't true. And also, it's not so easy to look into a shiny, sunny future if just like maybe your whole family had been murdered or you had been come from a concentration camp. Even if you said that's not what your movie is about. I mean, this was the reality of German life that people had to live next door with um, like the enemies of yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the um, this is something we discussed and we thought that it's probably better in this context to at least imply that there's at least a little more hope than there was before. And if that's just the fact that some kids can be dancing on the street for that one moment, honestly, I don't want to then uh, have them come outside and go, everything's great, and then the next day for them to go to an orphanage or for, you know, for them to be sent away somewhere else. That's not necessarily the way I think a film like this needs to end and that's just, just the way it is and that's a conscious decision on our part just to and it's not again look at the film it's not it's a fable it's not an authentic portrayal I mean otherwise watch a documentary like that's you know this what we're trying to do here is actually connect with people in the modern world and show them it's not a film about history It's a film about now. It's a film about how people interact with each other and how people um, and the attitudes of people who are around right now and trying to change that mindset and to try and get people to understand there is still hope in the world. And otherwise, what's the point in art? What's the point in anything if we're just out to depress people and make them and make the world devoid of any hope? Otherwise, we should just say, you know what? Those neo Nazis in, in the in, in the USA. Well, I guess that's all that's going to happen. We should just let them do it. Because otherwise, I don't want to make films if it's the only role that I have. Do you think we should um, politically talk to these people? Because obviously, in the movie Elsa can persuade Jojo, but these, as you said, are children. But what's with like grown ups? Because this has been a bit, big debate, like in Germany for the last two years. Like, should we talk? To Nazis, should we try to persuade them, or should we like shut them out of discourse? Do you want my opinion on what we should do with Nazis? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I don't like the idea of inciting violence, but um, a very, I do agree very much so that it's okay to punch them around the face. Um, you know, at the end of the war, it's a very clear. Rule: If you were a Nazi and if you were public with that information and you know you supported those ideas, then there was no place for you in society and you went to jail. Now, sadly, in 2020 or even two or three years ago, if you're a Nazi and you want to um, promote those ideas, then you can go to a town square and you can have your own rally and you can invite people along and the police will leave you alone. Or you can be in Germany and you can actually start a party. Um, it's it, So, no, I don't have any real um, leniency or I don't feel like they deserve a platform. Um, the, Last question, please. Um, the running gag where you offer Joe, or where Hitler offers Jojo cigarettes, I think it's hilarious, but... Um, How did you come up with this, especially since Hitler was a non-smoker and back then there was an anti-tobacco campaign in Nazi Germany? Um, because, so, well, <laughs> I just think <laughs> that the idea that someone so irresponsible is your, is your imaginary friend, I think that's, again, it's more important than the precise historical facts of, I mean, It's got, you've, got, it's, you've got to show this guy is such an idiot and such a, um, an irresponsible best friend in some way. And, you know, and that for me, it was, a, uh, it was a very important thing that it's, you know, and that A, that we're not showing him some, the kids smoking, but yeah, that, uh, that, that this very small thing is just this constant idea of like, of, of, him thinking that's appropriate behavior with a kid. Just one thing about your question before, I think also, you know, com Taika uses comedy as a way to draw people into the story and to, to, to let them use comedy as a way to sort of 
you know, drop down your barriers and, and maybe start a discussion or maybe look at the truth of the matter and see that actually there's a lot of stupidity in what's being said. And I think this film uses comedy in that way and that the laughs don't ever come for free. Um, I think that's part of the, the message and the, the way of using comedy. Thank you. Cool. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very much. Viel Spaß bei der Yeah. Danke. Danke.